Uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm uh, Sam Morgan, as you know, the Chief Executive of Solace Trust, and I'm here this afternoon to talk to you firstly about the Beacon um, upgrade and then to talk about the fourth uh, plank, which is um, supporting the movement in the uh, development plan. So I'm going to start off by talking about the Beacon upgrade. And um, uh, I want to start off by saying a couple of things. The first thing I want to say is that um, I, there will be an opportunity for you to ask some questions. But if I can't answer the question right now, this minute, it's not because I don't want to tell you the answer. It's because I want to go and find out I've got the answer right and then I will tell you it. Um, because whilst, I keep, whilst I've got a lot of information in my head, some of the very technical information I will need to go and double check because I'm not, a, I'm not a technical person. So I hope you'll bear with me, but I can promise you that the questions you ask, if I can't answer them, I will get you an answer for them after today and I'll send it to you. So please bear with me for that. The second thing is though, I would like you to ask any questions you're not sure about because the thing that worries me more than anything else is that people may assume things um, have been decided or are in the thinking um, and they may not be the case at all. So I'd rather you ask the question so we can put it right or tell you you are right rather than you worry about something and I don't know you're worrying about it because if I don't know you're worrying about it, I can't do anything about it. So please do do that. that. That would be fantastic. And the other thing I wanted to say about it is this beacon journey as with the trust um, uh, development plan journey, is all about the U3As. It's about uh, the U3A and having the U3A movement at its very heart. And my whole career in the charity sector has been about working with people at the heart of all I do. I really, really believe in that. And that's why I love working in the U3A movement so much because I totally believe it's so important that, it, that um, everything that happens around people are done and changed or improved or altered or kept the same with those very people themselves and with their information and their expertise. So the speaking uh, journey is about U3As. I just wanted to start with those few things. So... Um, I know that not everybody here is um, a Beacon user, so I wanted to start off with talking about Beacon. So what is Beacon? What is the Beacon system that we have, and many of us uh, cherish at the moment? Well, it's a management system designed and built and run by U3As for U3As. It gives you tools to run your U3A if, uh, easily and efficiently. And I know many uh, U3A Beacon users have told us how much they value that. It is what we call a single source of truth. So in other words, you've got one copy of your data in the Beacon system. And that's really important um, because it means that you're always working with the most up-to-date uh, data and list of memberships or other items that you have in the Beacon database and it's in one place and you know that. And that means it ensures continuity when committees change and we know our committees change regularly, people in our committees change regularly and um, we uh, talk about that a lot because we talk about having to get new committee members but having it in Beacon means that the next person coming along has access to the most up-to-date information that the person leaving that post had. It is a lightweight application that runs in the cloud and it is a single secure database. And the software was originally developed by U3A members and in particular John Franklin and it's now supported by a specialist development company called Sifware. And Sifware is a company that has a specialist experience in working with what is called um, legacy databases. 
So in other words, databases that have been, um, have been created and been used for some time. And the license to use the, um, the software developed by John Franklin was provided to the trust under something called a perpetual license, so we were allowed to carry on using it for as long as we wanted to use it. The coding as of that date he passed it to us from 2017. At that point, John Franklin and a few other uh, people involved in Beacon, um, in, the, in the development of Beacon, stepped back. But the numbers of U3As beginning to use the Beacon system had begun to increase quite significantly. And the trust said that we would be the guardian of the Beacon uh, software database, software management system, uh, for the benefit of U3As moving forward. The system is supported by the Beacon team, and I know there's many people from the Beacon team here. Um, there's over 40 volunteers in the Beacon team across the country, and we're really grateful to them because their enthusiasm and dedication means that U3As joining Beacon have support from a U3A member who really understands what it feels like to be a U3A member. And the Beacon team is supported by the Trust, and we have a dedicated staff member, uh, Adam, who you will have seen here today, and we have the volunteer support. And of course, we deal with all of the um, items such as invoicing, software development, which is now undertaken by uh, SIFWARE, and so on. Approximately 350 U3As uh, benefit from the Beacon system at the moment, and we have about 200,000 members on that system. So quite a significant number of U3A members' details on that system. We have 100 U3As who are in various stages of implementing Beacon right now. And we feel the benefits of U3As using Beacon are huge, um, not least from a security uh, perspective because it is on a database system and it's not on a spreadsheet or it's not on a, um, on a database on a laptop. Um, which, which, uh, which, which is not the most up-to-date or um, may, be, uh, may not be able to be kept as securely. So you'll be thinking, and I know we've had various discussions with various people, and will continue to do so, I am sure, um, why are we upgrading Beacon? So what we know is that all bespoke software, and by bespoke we mean particularly written for us, contains certain elements of risk. We also know that we want to have continuous development because we've been told by Beacon users through the forum and through emails and through discussion that actually enhancements are wanted from time to time. Once they want the system to do other things, and because bugs in the system happen and continually need to be addressed. We also need to ensure, um, so that's um, the trust and U3As need to ensure that um, it has compliance with new and updated legislation. So we've had the experience, many of us, of GDPR. Um, and we need to make sure we have systems that can respond to changes, and there will always be changes, um, easily and uh, readily and quickly. But we also need to ensure that we have control uh, costs that we can control and costs which do not become significant for U3As. Because one of the reasons that we really like Beacon is that it enables U3As to use it, keep safe, keep their data secure, it's easy to use. But U3As use Beacon, amongst other reasons, because <coughs> it is, um, is, is cost-effective for them to use it. So it is important that we keep those costs under control so they keep using Beacon 
because if the costs rise too high, people won't use Beacon, and that will defeat the purpose. So we need to keep those costs under control. Let's turn my page over so I can get some more notes. Um, so moving on. The Trust itself is not a, a software company. We've talked this morning about the fact that we're a learning charity, and we're really proud of that. We're really proud of the fact we have this massive learning movement. So because we are not a um, software company, and because we are a tiny team, as we said earlier today, we've got 14 members of staff, we haven't got, the, we haven't got an IT department. We've got, we are dependent on one particular person, Adam, to help us with that interface with an uh, external company called Sifware. And the movement continues to grow, which we're really proud about. Um, but actually, being a, uh, a software provider, a database provider, is not our key and core area of skill. Running a bespoke system requires quite significant ongoing investment. And we need to ensure highly skilled staff and contractors to ensure that system continues running in the way it runs. And we also know, even our, in our own everyday lives, with the, so with, with the um, IT that we may use, whether it's on our phone or whether it's internet on the TV or anything like that, we know that the pace of change in the software industry and in IT is ever increasing. And we want to, and we know we want to keep up with it, and we know keeping up with it is important. So the next reason we want to upgrade Beacon is we want to take advantage of the opportunity that Beacon presents to us. So we've learnt so much from the current system. We understand what is important to U3As with member-to-member -member support. We understand what U3As have told us about what's important to them with software functionality. And we understand it needs to meet the needs of the user base. So we want to make sure that we're using the most up-to-date tools and methods in collaboration with a partner, which we are still to finalise to ensure that we make the most of that opportunity and to ensure that the movement has a reliable and secure and flexible system to meet the needs both now and in the future. And we want to be able to integrate that with other support systems such as the website, such as U3A's website. At the moment, we have two separate systems. We have a beacon system uh, that um, a significant number of youth rates use, and we have a site builder website that we have about 700 youth rates use, but they're not joined up. And actually, being able to join things together to enable those, um, those different systems to be able to uh, speak to each other for youth rates and others also that youth rates may want to use is important. And we also want to reduce, our aim is to reduce ongoing costs for U3As by providing something that is joined up. So, what is our vision? So, based on what I've just said, the vision of this project is to upgrade Beacon and give the U3A movement a system which does, is designed with the needs of the whole U3A movement in mind, that's really most important. By that we mean is sympathetic to the needs of U3A members, is easy to use, is fully accessible by, a mem by any member that needs to use it, and is based on the prototype offered by the Beacon system and other systems that we use already, like Sifware, so a site builder. Um, we want to ensure it's based on up-to-date, secure and reliable technology. So we want to ensure it, there is security by design. And that, 
that's really important to me because one of the things that um, someone pointed out to me at, at, was that um, when we had the talk talk problem some years ago, I don't even remember talk talk had a problem with uh, with their data um, that had I think 200,000 uh, elements of data on that system. And our beacon system is at that and will be more, hopefully, going forward in the future because we want U3As to be used at Beacon Database. And I want to be sure at all times that everything is secure um, because I'm very, very responsible for all of this from a trust perspective and you're responsible from a local perspective. So that security is really important to me um, for U3As and to you within your U3As. We want it to comply with regulations, and whilst um, I know regulations take time to, to work around and understand and adhere to, those regulations are not going to go away, and we're going to get more of them, I suspect, over time, and we need a system that complies with those regulations. By doing so, and having security in de by design, we reduce risk, but we're also mindful of future needs of U3As and the things that they would like a membership management system to do. What's really important is we want to ensure the Beacon system is capable of being used across the movement by small U3As and large U3As and all the U3As between. But we also know that whilst U3As have a lot of commonalities, they also have a lot of differences. And we want to ensure the system can accommodate the commonalities and the differences of U3A and the U3A movement, because it's that that makes it so great. We want it to focus on areas of administration that's important to U3As. We want to ensure it remains supported by the Beacon team who are so valuable to the program. And taking into account all of the tangible and intangible costs and benefits to users and to the trust, it's absolutely vital it's cost effective. So that was our overall vision of what we wanted to get, of what we wanted to achieve. So what have we done? So following the announcement of the upgrade project in December, a working group was set up to steer it. And you'll see the members of the Beacon Upgrade group here. Um, and you'll see on that list that, uh, aside from myself, we have um, people on that working group who are U3A members, some of whom use Beacon and some of whom don't use Beacon. And that was important because, as well as having people on that working group who have the experience and knowledge of software systems and IT, we also wanted to have people on, you, on the working group that were Beacon users and people who weren't Beacon users because we hope that many more people will join Beacon, but also because we wanted people to ask those questions that we might, not, we might not automatically think to ask ourselves otherwise. So that is why we, had, um, we have that group. Now, since that time, uh, we've been the fortunate recipients of some of the work that the Beacon user group um, have, uh, have undertaken. And one of the things that we have asked uh, the Beacon, a representative of the Beacon News Group, is whether they would consider uh, joining the Beacon Upgrade Working Group to bring on board some of their knowledge and experience and views also. So one of the first things we did, and what we will continue to do through this project, is uh, consultation. So we wanted to speak to U3A members, and we want to continue to speak to U3A members throughout this whole program um, in order to learn from them about what, uh, what they want and what they're looking for, and also to learn from them what they are hearing when we talk and give updates, um, and also to understand and um, ensure that the beacon vision is the vision of U3As. So we carried out 
three uh, surveys. The first survey went to all U3As, and we had 550 responses, 50, 565 responses from U3As. And it was to ask what kind of support U3As would want from a management system and how a system could help, that achieve, help them achieve that. A second survey went to Beacon users, and we asked in that second survey, what is good about Beacon and what could be improved? And a similar survey was carried out by the Beacon user group, uh, which, is, which we're very grateful for. A third survey went to non-users of Beacon, and we wanted to ask why they didn't use Beacon and what they used instead of it to get that full picture. And we followed that up with three focus groups in different locations across the United Kingdom, with a range of participants from U3A committees, and we looked in depth at topics from U3A administration. We looked at membership, and we looked at finance, and we looked at the website. We also looked at the um, beacon use analysis. So in other words, we, did some, we looked at the anonymous information from audit logs over a year to discover how it's used. And we looked at U3A processes, so how U3A administration works, and what are the points of similarity and the areas of difference between how U3As work. And a really good example of that was when, when we were discussing that was if you actually even start with um, how U3As uh, arrive at their uh, membership, their local membership fee, some U3As have a what I call a pay as you go system, so quite a low cost fee, and then you pay for each user group you go to. Some U3As have an all-inclusive fee, so you have one fee and you can go to everything. And some U3As have a bit of a hybrid with a bit of a, bit of a pay as you go and a, and a bit of all-inclusive. So even starting with that, the administration of how U3As manage those fees and uh, supports the interest groups resulting from that is very different. So responding to what U3As told us, so all of the information that you, we gathered from that consultation exercise so far has fed into an outline specification of requirements that responds to those needs that have been highlighted in that consultation period. And our outline specification is, what is, um, is based on what we know from the existing Beacon software and from our consultation. Our outline, our outline uh, specification comprises six key themes on relating to the management of U3As. And these six themes have come out of our consultation. So we have membership. And included in membership is joining a U3A, renewals, record keeping, and self-service, so members can update their own details on the Beacon system. That's what we understand uh, Beacon users want to happen. We then looked at groups. And under groups, we looked at interest groups. Other groups, like one-off groups, when um, a U3A may take a group of people um, to, to see an area of interest or to the theatre, or something similar. Group finance management and self-service allowing group leaders to manage their groups. We looked at events, and with events we mean regular interest group meetings, one-off events, and online booking and payment for events. And we looked at finances recording income and expenditure across U3As, and understanding that what U3As are looking for is, for is for areas to be as automated as possible. And interestingly, following on from 
part of a discussion I listened to yesterday at the Beacon Drop-In, ensuring that reporting through finance meets the requirements of the Charity Commission, but also the HMRC, particularly in relation to gift aid, which is really important for U3As. The website, that U3As want to be able to publish information on a website um, for the public and for their members. They want to enable that website to be easy to, uh, to use and to update. And they want to have one point of reference for information about their events and groups. And reporting, so being able to understand um, the membership, to be able to analyze the membership, the groups, events, and finances, and to have an audit log to track system changes and system uses in relation to Beacon. Throughout, threaded throughout the whole of that is communications. So the whole system needs to be flexible to ensure good communications. And it would, it's important that that is designed throughout the whole of each and every one of those sections before. So non-functional requirements. So you see in front of you an outline of the non-functional requirements of the new system. So it has to be flexible. It has to enable ongoing and future development of the system as U3A's uh, needs change. It has to have an accessible interface, so accessible to all users, by design, it has to be simple. It has to be mobile and tablet friendly because whilst many of our members may not have access to a computer, many may have an iPad or many may have a phone on which you have the uh, internet available, a smartphone. Um, we need to ensure the system can be used in those areas of the uh, United Kingdom, where there is limited internet connection, because we know that is the case. And we have to be aware of the challenges that may be faced by members when using such a system uh, for the first time, and to ensure that they feel confident being able to use it. We want to ensure the system is U3A branded and fits in with the uh, raising the profile uh, working groups guidance on brand guidelines and we need to ensure that brand is consistent across the movement so that it is a very much seen as a U3A, um, a U3A service that's, that is provided and people feel it's theirs. We need to ensure that it meets uh, compliance needs as I said a moment ago to meet with uh, legislation and helps U3A stay compliant as well as the, uh, the tool itself being compliant. We want to ensure it has the capacity to be used by all U3As who want to use it, both the U3As that have it now and all the U3As that we will have in the future. And we hope many of you who are not on Beacon may consider joining the Beacon system. We want to ensure that it's secure, um, secure by design, and that there is good access uh, to uh, controlling that system. We want to ensure that there is continued in-depth technical support available at all times for U3A uh, organisations. And we want to ensure that the Beacon team support is um, weaved through the heart of this new service. And finally, in terms of migration, um, we want to ensure that it's easy for existing Beacon users to migrate to and to new Beacon users whose data may be stored in a variety of other ways. So, in order to ensure, having taken, having been relatively clear about what we, uh, what we want to uh, achieve from this system, we wanted to find a partner that's going to be the right partner to meet the needs of U3A. And we began to go through a 
a very clear procurement uh, process. And that's really important because any organisation that works with us has to have the culture and ethos of U3A um, very clear in its mind um, as they work with us on this journey. Um, we're really clear what the U3A uh, culture is all about. We're really clear that the movement is comprised of over a thousand independent organisations with very committed people leading them, with a massive range of experience between them, and that U3As themselves, whilst, as I said before, whilst having a degree of commonality in some areas, are also quite different. And we wanted to ensure that that was built into um, very much at the forefront of, um, of any partner that we, that we work with in the future. Because if that isn't right, the programme won't work. So the first stage after the consultation was to send out a request of information to a number of organisations that could meet our needs for a membership management uh, system. And we sent, out, uh, we sent out the request for information and we had responses from 10 companies. And the working group assessed those responses and four organisations were invited to present to the working group in August. And we spent a day with each of those groups. And we had the ability to ask them lots and lots of questions about, um, not only about the system itself, but also about the approach and what they understood about the U3O movement. So after that, we will um, assess those uh, organisations, and we will draw up a, a, uh, a shortlisted partner to scope the project and provide an accurate estimation of the cost and time scale so that we can recommend that partner to the Finance Committee and then to the Board. And that is why um, you, when people say, how much is it going to cost, well, we can't tell you that exactly yet because we haven't reached that stage but we will tell you as soon as we know that answer because we understand that's very important and then we will make a contract with that partner um, once it has been approved by the board of trustees so we're very clear that actually uh, this partnership is a long-term partnership and as I said a moment ago um, it has to be uh, some, an organisation that understands the U3A, their needs, and that they can align with the culture and our values. And our values are the members at the heart of all we do. And to help us look at the future direction of how we manage um, the tools that we use to manage our membership, taking into account all of those things we want to do in the development plan for the benefit of members. Um, so we're looking at not just an organisation, but we're very much looking at a partner and a partner that understands us and that we have confidence in and you have confidence in and that you and we understand them. So, as we have before and moving forward in the future, we will continue to have a phased approach to this programme and we want to involve U3As and members at every stage of that. And that will include you sending us emails, which you do. Um, we have emails, lots of emails, and that's very helpful because we understand what, what you're thinking about. It will involve... Um, Sending out, asking you for more information uh, through, through questionnaires, through inviting you to focus groups, to having the opportunity to speak to the user group um, and understanding uh, what they're thinking. And it will involve um, asking U3As to come and work with us and try out uh, parts of that system as it begins to be developed. So if we look at the forecasted timetable, 
So we haven't, as you can imagine, at this moment in time, because we haven't finalised the partners, the outline plan for delivery is not set in stone. But after the partner is chosen, we'll have a period, which I understand the term, the right term to use is discovery. And that will start in September. And what that means is we'll look in depth at the requirements of U3A, so in even more depth at the requirements of U3As. And that will involve U3As of all shapes and sizes, um, a representative sample of large, medium and small, beacon users and non-beacon users, and across the movement, geographically. We'll then build the, uh, the system, and that will carry on for the rest of the year and into the beginning of 2020, we believe. And that will be based on information um, that we've already collected so far and from the discovery phase. And from that, we will put together a system which means the basic core requirements of U3As with, with Beacon in terms of a membership management system. And it will give us a platform upon which to build and U3As through, during that process will continue to be consulted and we will report back at each stage. And then we will have some user testing when a few intrepid U3As are migrated onto the system and start to use it and we hope that will take place from April 2020. And we hope at least 10 U3As from a representative sample will come forward um, to try it out and give it a test drive. It feels a bit like a car. <laughs> and, um, and, feed, and feed back to us um, how they feel it, it's, it's working for them. And we'll use the information back from that to continually to, con to improve upon uh, what we have built so far and to continue to get the feedback from that from those users. Finally, we'll have the, the whole migration and it will be a general release to, um, to, to, uh, to, to Beacon uh, users and to other people who want to come on to, other organizations, other Israel organizations that want to come on to, to Beacon. And again, in that uh, drop-in session I was in yesterday, people were worried about, will we be told you're on this date. And actually, no, what we're going to do is work with you to work out the right date and the right time when we get to that migration process. So it is, a, it is done in a, um, in, a, in a managed way for you. We will give priority to use rays already on the Beacon system as their data will be in that common format. So if you're not on Beacon, um, please do, and you want to, uh, and you want to join, you might like to think you, you might want to consider about joining Beacon now. Um, and U3A is not on Beacon when they decide, if they decide to join the Beacon system, will receive support from our wonderful Beacon team to prepare their data for that migration. So what next? This project, as I've hope, I hope I've tried to be clear all the way through, um, is about U3A members. We are using a piece of technology to help us with U3As and managing U3As. But this isn't about technology. This is about U3As, and it's about helping our committees and the people responsible in U3A, so many of you who do an amazing amount of work, helping you to continue to do things easily um, and efficiently and without taking up as too much of your time and enabling you to get the information you need um, as quickly as you can. Because it's about U3A members, the U3A members will be involved throughout and the upgrade will rely on your continued participation because this system will be built based on your knowledge and expertise to deliver a system that is by the U3A for the U3A. The Beacon team will remain in place and support will continue to be offered on a member-to-member -member basis and for that I think we're all very grateful. And the upgrade will be overseen by the Beacon Upgrade Working Group with input from the Beacon user group. So 
um, how to get involved. Well, we will ask you regularly to, uh, for information for what you're feeling about each part of this process. We will continue to put information out on the Beacon website. We will continue to update, uh, send out updates in relation to the upgrade through the newsletter and through Beacon News. So sign up for the newsletter and Beacon News if you haven't already done so. You can continue to send in emails and we will be very happy to respond to those. And you can pick up the phone um, and you can talk to any one of the, uh, user, the people on the working group. You can contact the user group. We will continue to talk through um, with you at each stage of development how Beacon is progressing. And we will be telling you, um, should you wish to do so, how to get involved in the discovery phase, um, which is the next phase of this programme. And the other thing I was asked to ask you is um, the Beacon team are looking for more supporters. So um, if you are interested, please do email in via the Beacon website because we'd be very, very grateful to, to have you on our team. So in summary, um, why upgrade Beacon? Well, we wanted to upgrade Beacon to ensure we continue to focus down on risk reduction because it is um, uh, providing a membership management service is not a core activity for the trust. It, our core activity is learning. But we want, to, um, we want to be able to support that service to U3As because it's an opportunity to do some of those things that U3As have asked us to assist with, um, things they'd like Beacon to do, but we haven't been able to do with Beacon. For example, having an integrated um, uh, website with, a, with, with, the, with the membership management system. Uh, what have we done so far? Well, we've had a lot of consultation. Um, we've put together a specification and we've begun a procurement exercise. And what's happening next? Well, we want to have a partner that you all feel confident with, and we feel confident with, who understands the U3A culture, understands us and how we work and how we think. We want to have a phased approach so it happens in the right time. And we want to ensure that members are involved throughout of this process, all the way through. So you can find out more information on the website and you can keep up to date with Beacon News. But if you have any questions now, please ask me. I will do my best. Be kind to me who's not an IT person. I'll do my best to answer them. And if I can't answer them now, or um, there's not someone here that can answer them, I will find that answer and I will come back to you with as much information as I can give you. Thank you. Brian Gilmore, Huntingdon, U3A. Uh, I'm fairly new to U3A and uh, I've not used Beacon, but I've heard about it in my uh, group. And mostly what I hear is it's, it's good for some things, but other things they wouldn't touch you with a barge pole. Um, you're, what I've seen in your presentation, you're not upgrading Beacon, you're replacing it. And I think by selling it as an upgrade, you probably take all people's baggage about Beacon with it. If you sell it as an upgrade, then you might get more people to, to come on to it. Sorry, if you sell it as a new system, yeah. Right. Um, so, so, so just to answer that question. Well, we felt that it is working on, uh, so I, I'm, I'm, going to, I'm going to answer this as a non-technical person. So it will be putting it onto a new system in terms of software but we're using what is at the heart of Beacon in the, new Beacon, in the new Beacon system that we want to continue with in the future. 
So from that perspective, what we, were say, what we wanted to say was that Beacon is more than a piece of software. Beacon is a, is a, is a system that people use that includes um, user members, the team, the Beacon team, and so on and so forth. So we called it an upgrade because for, from our perspective, from a non-technical perspective, we were trying to take the best of Beacon and move it to, and upgrade it to allow it to do more, to enable it to do what U3As were telling us they wanted it to do. And that's why we called it a Beacon upgrade. But um, if it's the wrong terminology and you feel another terminology might have been used, well, yes, absolutely, that, that, absolutely that's your view and you could well be right. District. Um, we're very proud. We were the first ones to go live on the Beacon system and we love it. We think it's great. But the one part we don't use is the online renewals because we didn't want to have a PayPal account. Right. Will the new upgrade or new system allow us to uh, have online renewals through, say, Barclays, Lloyds, whatever bank? Okay. Well, um, so, from my understanding, um, you will be able to do online renewals. And I, from my understanding is, I believe we will be able to, I'm looking for Adam, I believe we will be able to use a range of providers to take online renewals. That's great, thank you. And that was with all of the systems that we looked at, all of the four providers. Yeah. So who am I looking at? So. Hello, Christine oh. Bayliss, Coventry. Yeah. Um, what are the costs of using Beacon? The cost? Yeah. The cost to you? As an individual, U3A. To the U3A, right. At the moment, the cost to you is a pound per user. And so what we are looking for with, um, with the, uh, the new system, whatever is the right phrase to use, is we, were, we don't want that amount to be any more than it has to. So we'd like it to be a pound or less. Um, that's where we'd like to get to. Obviously, until we have more information, we can't, I can't promise you any of that. But what I'm really clear about is it can't be expensive because otherwise no use rays are going to use it. For me, I'd like it to be as low as we possibly can. And if we can be lower than what it is now, then I'd be really happy. <laughs> I'm sure you would too. So. Uh, Jane Matheson, Teasdale. Um, we have discussed whether regions stroke networks can use this. Is there any progress on that? Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so that, so we have been asked before whether networks can use Beacon. And in theory, the Trust doesn't have a problem with networks using Beacon. But our problem is that the license we have, the perpetual license we have to use the code was given to members of the trust. And technically, networks are not members of the trust. We don't have, if you look at the Articles of Association of the Trust, the members are all of you U3As, but not networks. So our aim would be for an upgraded system to be allowed to, that would allow us to include networks. And if we're ever in the position to change that with the existing um, with the existing situation, of course, we'd like networks also to be able to use it. Uh, my name is Diane Ramsey, Arthur West Wilts, U3A. Will your presentation be put on the website? Yes. Thank you. Huh? Hello. Um, Stuart Murray, Flintshire, U3A. I'm over here. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Uh, just watch. If this all works and um, we end up with a, a product that works for all the U3As, seems to me that potentially it would be a very attractive product to a whole lot of other people as well. And I just wondered whether, I don't want to disrupt the timeline and the, the mm -hmm. planning, but just wonder whether when you're talking about the discovery phase and this being a long-term project, whether there should be an opportunity for whoever's representing the new trading company interest to have an input into 
the finalisation of the specification so that if it becomes something that in the long term can be used as a trading product, then uh, you've thought about it at the start. Okay, so just, just to explain what the trading company is. So the trading company is um, a wholly owned subsidiary of the um, charity. So the reason, uh, just to pick up on what Richard said this morning, the reason that we have a trading company is because some of the um, items that we undertake, some of the activities we undertake as a charity, so that, that is the, uh, the production and distribution of third age matters and our merchandise, so the diaries and all of that, had gone over a limit um, of um, turnover that you're allowed to have within a charity before you have to put it into a trading company. So we had to set up the subsidiary trading company. That subsidiary trading company is wholly owned by the trust and it's for the benefit of the trust and for U3As. And I know one of the things Richard was saying this morning was it needs to break even or make a profit, but any profit from that subsidiary trading company has to be gift aided back to the main charity for the benefit of the uh, beneficiaries of U3As. And our beneficiaries in the Third Age Trust are all you U3A organisations. So it won't ever be used by anybody else apart from U3A. So the whole, this, this system is only for U3As. Nobody else, no other organisations, no other external organisations, no other partners. It's just for our use. Uh, Bob Orrick from uh, Charfonts. Um, if I understood you correctly, there's 350 current U3As using... Yes. Yes, which is a minority. Um, yes. It's when the implementation phase takes place, will that status quo remain or will it be compulsory for all U3As to use the Beacon 2 system? So I didn't, I didn't quite catch that. Well, you are, you're 350 U3As are using the system, which is a minority of U3As. Yes. Once the implementation of Beacon 2 takes place... Yes. Will all U3As be required to use it, or will oh. the status quo remain? All right, no. So, so I think what you're asking me. So I'm, I didn't, I didn't, I can't quite understand. But I think what you're saying is, at the moment, 350 U3As use it, and actually we've got another hundred that are either in the pipeline or showing interest in using it. So working towards half. But I think you're saying, will all U3As be required to use it? And no, we cannot require you all to use it because you're all independent charities. We hope, we'd love you all to be able to use it because if, we, if you all wanted to use it, it would be totally the right project cause you, pro product because you'd all want it. So yes, our aspiration, I guess, should be that you'd all want to use it, but can we make you use it? No. I think... Oh. Hello. Wendy Hatchell from Hi. Doncaster U3A. Yeah. I think we all appreciate the attention to detail and the hard work that's gone into yeah. getting us to where we are at the moment. But there's two things that occur to me. One is that by bringing in an outside company, you're actually increasing a level of risk, which we don't have at the moment. Because you are then dependent on that company continuing to trade and continuing to work successfully with ourselves. So that's one aspect of it. And the other aspect is that I would like to see, before we get to the um, decision process of who we're going to go with, a mapping exercise of the preferred um, shortlisted system or systems against the existing beacon system. Okay. Um, so that we can see the fors and against yeah. of both, as you would do in a decision-making process if you were doing it yourself. Okay, so so two parts that then. So the first um, the first part is um, how can we be sure that we're not at any more risk than we are at the moment? I think in terms of the company. So could the company fold? So part of choosing a partner um, with anything you do as a charity, um, but in particular with this particular this particular project is making sure you undertake enough due diligence to ensure that company is robust. And by robust, we're looking at its um, financial history, 
um, the degree of it, the number of things like the number of customers it has, the breadth of those customers, the strength of the expertise it has in that organisation, so on and so forth. So we would be required to demonstrate for ourselves and for you, but also to our auditors who would look at any large contract and how we'd come to that decision, that we'd undertaken that due diligence. Because what we can't do is put the, the funds of the U3A movement, so the trust funds, the funds that we are guardians for, at risk. We have a duty of care in relation to those, those partnerships and those investments with anything we do. In, in the same way um, as what we have to do when we choose a printing company to print TAM, which is a large contract, um, or distribution company to distribute it, which is a very large contract. So the same thing, we have to look at the resilience of those companies and we have to demonstrate that. The second part of the question is, will we be able to put something out that shows uh, what the differences are, would be between the existing Beacon product and the new potential Beacon product? And that's a very good point, and I'm sure that's something we should be able to do. Keith Jones from Leak U3A. I'm assuming that the proposed development is a, is a fully bespoke development of a software system rather than being based on an existing commercial product. But perhaps you clarify that. Right. And the, the second part of the question is, uh, will there be an option in the contract to secure ownership of the source, car, uh, source code uh, should the supplying company actually go bust? Or indeed, will ownership of the source code be part of the contract from the start? Right. So I'm going to look for a bit of help here because <laughs> I know my limitations. So this is what I believe, and I'm going to ask if I'm right or wrong. So uh, somebody from the Beacon Working Group can help me with this. So my understanding is that we'll be buying a product that will be shaped to meet our needs rather than starting with something that's being written for us from scratch. That's my understanding. And someone's going to tell me if I've got that right or wrong. The second thing, I, my understanding is that we would own... Um, the data on the database. And that, so in other words, we would own, you would own your data and we would own our data on that database. But you're asking me another part of the question. I can't remember what it is. What was the second bit? The source code. I don't, would we own the source code? We would negotiate an escrow So can you come and say that a bit louder? <laughs> So um, what we would do is we will be negotiating an escrow agreement. So should the supplier of the new system disappear or go under, then we would retain the right to, to continue to use it with a new sort of partner. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I think we've got some people have been waiting down here for a bit. <laughs> oh, so about you, I'll let, right, and then I'll do these people. Yeah. Uh, John Fairhurst, Malmesbury and District. A big project like this is going to cost quite a lot. And I see some tension in whichever way you go about it. If it's chargeable to the current Beacon users through the increase in price, we would be paying, obviously, for a development that is going to benefit the entire UC, the U3A eventually. But if you do it the other way and pay for it out of development funds, then two-thirds of the U3A who aren't actually at mm -hmm. the moment contributing will be paying for something they might never use. I don't see a solution to that conundrum. <laughs> um, so, um, we, we want, I guess the answer is that we're trying to produce a system that we hope everybody will use. And we have to do that in the fairest possible way for everybody. And, um, but I guess everyone's always going, there's always going to be some degree of unfairness, however you look at it, to somebody. Because at the moment, we already have the situation where some U3A say, I'm being charged a pound to use Beacon per head. And I'm tiny, it's not fair, because there's some very big U3As. And the very big U3As say, it's not fair I'm being charged a pound because I'm a very big U3A, and I should pay less than a small one. So I guess it's the same with saying, who pays for Beacon? Um, where do, you know, who pays for Beacon? Um, is it the users that come onto Beacon, or is it 
everybody, in which case, what happens to people that aren't on Beacon? So the current model is that the Beacon costs are paid for by people that use the Beacon system. I guess our, from my perspective, our aim is that we want to reduce that cost as much as we can. And the more people that are involved in Beacon, in the Beacon upgrade or whatever the right phrase is going forward, they, we would hope that the less that cost would be. So, um, but as to the fairness of the model, well, um, I, I can't say I can answer that completely as to how I'd, how I'd square that circle that you'd, in, in all honesty. But the current model is the Beacon users pay for the Beacon system. Derek Blaney, Lewis U3A. Yes. You knew I was going to ask a question. I did, I did. I had to make sure you did, because I thought otherwise if you leave the room without asking a question, you're going to be thinking she, oh, she decided not to let me ask one. So. Uh, it's a very simple question, I see. Yeah. You've shown us a, a, a project plan, you've shown us some phases of what's going to happen next, you've shown us what's happened so far. What we don't see at all is this represented on the Beacon website. It would be very useful to be able to see these phases and for you to tell us on a regular basis where we are in these phases because you've already told us that what's going to happen in April was not what we thought was going to happen in April. So it's now a, a pilot run rather than the beginning of a rollout. We are not being informed as much as we would like to be. Okay. Uh, Beacon News the last Beacon newsletter was released six weeks ago and contained no information about the Beacon Upgrade project. It's time that, inf that newsletter is made, made more informative and more useful to, uh, to us. Yeah. Last bit, it would be very nice to have a copy of the outline spec because yeah. that is of great interest to anybody who might want to use Beacon 2 in the future. Okay, so um, First part of it, yeah, um, absolutely, we will, it will all go on the Beacon website. And, um, and I apologise, you, you don't feel you've had as, many, as much communication as you feel you'd like. And I would say we do get slightly sidetracked at this part of the year because of the conference, which is major for us because we have this small team. But nonetheless, it's really important that you do feel informed. I want everyone to feel informed and to feel they're getting everything they need to know. That's really important for me. And for you, I understand that. So yes, absolutely. I think the second bit was, will you see the specification? And yes, we do want to share that. We want to share that with um, with um, with you three A's, and in particular, I understand why it's really important to be able to share that with the with the user group also. And and maybe that's a conversation. The best way to do that is a conversation we should have. Is that all right? Any more questions? Oh, a lady. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay, you are a lady. <laughs> Jane Matheson, Teasdale. I thought the money that we pay in, the 50p that was and now the pound, I thought that was ring-fenced for use for whatever to do with Beacon. So yes. is any money that's still in that ring fence bit is that going towards the development, or what is that money used for? So one of the things somebody asked earlier, so it's for use for Beacon. It's used for paying for, for the Beacons, the Beacon, um, the current Beacon system. And one of, the, one of the things a lady asked earlier, sitting near the back in the first, in the first, um, in the, uh, uh, join the Treasury's uh, discussion, was uh, really good to have an update as to that income and that expenditure and what that looks like. So we'll, we, will, we, will, we will give you what that looks like. So I think that's really important. What happened was, I don't know if you rem there will be some of you that would have been to a meeting in December last year when Ian uh, took us through um, this, the expenditure on Beacon and how we'd use a lot of money on Beacon, which was over and above the income we had in and what that looked like and how we were trying to try and actually make that balance because as somebody, the gentleman over there pointed out that um, Beacon is only used by Beacon users, not the entire movement. So I think what we, it's important for you to have is where we are in that, what, what we've had in, what have we spent out, what is it spent on in relation to Beacon, so you're confident with that because if you're confident with that, then anybody else that's got that same question will be the same. Oh, John.
Oh, hello, it's John Waddington from Wokingham. Um, yes, you probably thought I was going to ask a question as well. Um, you've, we, there's been some mention of the Beacon user group, um, and it's at the moment a very unofficial organisation, and I think perhaps a lot of U3As present um, may have heard of it, may not have heard of it, may be wondering whether it could be useful or not. Um, uh, to, to perhaps briefly, very briefly say, um, there's been a few um, unofficial people, steering committee, call it what you will, um, acting on an individual's basis who've tried to establish this group and get it running and we have been liaising with you. Um, can you perhaps just explain how we may progress that, bring it forward? Yeah. Um, maybe we could get some feedback from the members here whether they feel there is a, um, a need for an independent group to ref reflect the views of Beacon users and be a conduit um, in the future on a usage basis. So, so sorry, were you saying, just to, are you saying, would it be, uh, are we happy to put that on a, on a, some kind of um, formal footing? Yes, yeah. at, at the moment. I mean, it's a completely it's informal loose. arrangement. Yeah, uh, we've been had contact with quite a lot of U3As, yeah. um, but at the moment it, it's a completely informal arrangement. Yeah. Um, how we may integrate it perhaps with future activities. Yeah, so I think that's a really good idea. I think maybe we need to have a conversation about that and then we can talk about that and you can talk with the informal grouping and we can work out how we're going to take that forward. Yeah. And hopefully in the, in the presentation, so hopefully you feel that I've actually mentioned the user group and how we would like to work with the group. Yes, indeed, and, and we appreciate that. I, I mean, maybe just even a show of hands, do yeah. people think it's a, a no. worthwhile organisation as, as an extra cog in the wheel? Would you like to show your? Ha would you like to show if you'd like to? Um, to gent enthusiastic gentleman at the back there. Would, if we, uh, if you'd like to have a um, a user group, an independent user group. So some yes, some no. I think if we're able to for firm that up, we can have a kind of more, more kind of like robust discussion about that. That might be useful. Is that all right? Brilliant. Okay. Hopefully you feel... You, oh, sorry, Alan down there. <laughs> Alan Green from Bishop's Clave. Um, I've been involved in the developing the movement working group and trying to find out from the centre a little bit more about what the membership looks like and such like. Um, that raises a question in my mind about who owns, who will own the data in the new system. Right. Clearly, individual U3As will need to own their own data and they've got to manage the privacy and, and those sorts yeah. of aspects of, of that and the centre, by which I might mean national office and maybe regional support teams, they're not going to be interested in individual privacy-related stuff, but they could well be interested in aggregate data of how many members there are in, in uh, individual U3As, maybe the, the men-to-women ratio or those sorts of things. So it seems to me then that there's an issue here about is the centre, national, regional, whatever level, going to have some sort of access to um, anonymised data for, that is owned by the individual U3As. Yeah. So at the moment, we have, um, for example, in Site Builder, in fact, I'm going to talk about this in a minute. Um, one, one, at the moment, through Site Builder, for example, we've got all the U3As that are on Site Builder. Um, enables us, my understanding is, to see how many different types of interest groups there are. Yeah? So we kind of gather some of that information already. I guess what we need to do in the build of it is to say, what, what can we do that, feel that is, that is anonymised and safe and OK and everyone feels that's all right, like we do with the interest groups? And, and, but is there a line about which it's not OK, in which case we need to know that we can't build that in? So that is my very non-technical answer to that. My practical experience of what we do in Site Builder with the interest groups already, or what U3As do, um, seems quite sensible, because actually that's public information already, but it's drawing it down, if you see what I mean. Similarly, I guess, if you, if you went round and added up all the numbers of people in a U3A in every region, you could do that on a on a case by case basis. I guess you could if you 
we sat down and went through all of the um, annual returns. Um, so I guess there's some things that is okay because you're actually giving that to the charity commission already, uh, so it's public. Um, but there's a line about things which is private data, which youth rays wouldn't want to show, which we can't we can't include. Yeah. Okay.